right, that's spook. I want to <coughs> show you what I um, what I was working on really hard before I went back to this uh, YouTube stuff. I had a bunch of YouTube stuff from like a year and a half ago where I was playing around with the YouTube API. Then I decided I'd make this this thing I've been making, planning to make for years and years and years. And um, uh, but then I decided to use some of the video stuff and make a whole new system with what I'd learned and some of the pieces. So, but this is really what I'm working on planning to provide. So this is a little tile map maker. I can make hexagons, oh, pentagons or hexagons. And the little white line is where it knows it's added together. I can make all, any side object. Of course they don't necessarily match up in those cases. But uh -oh. here we go. Right now I just have it choosing a new color. Here's the color palette thing. Just switch it around. And I'm gonna use this for all kinds of things. There's just a little piece in there and an arrow. You can go wherever you want. Triangles. And there's always patterns you can make. Anyway, this is what I really am doing. Well, my website's really just a plot to make people use these in the end. I have a little 3D thing too. Zing. Oop, it's a little funky now, that's why I haven't released it. I wrote this little. It does, it'll project in 3D. Got a little funny perspective there. Yeah, the 3D is experimental, the whole thing. Okay. Anyway. So, I mean, yeah. If the topic is, you know, influence of Nietzsche. No. Pythagoras. I don't know. Okay. This is a part of my message, that's all. So Das Buch, here's a painting that my mom painted, um, I think of me. Uh, I think she said it was of me, but I'm not sure about that. But in a, she was in a pretty depressed state of mind. It was after I had moved out. I was probably 18, been out for a year or so. And uh, yeah, it's not necessarily unsympathetic except for fires of hell being there and the pointy ears and me being a devil but I think maybe maybe I'm Vulcan it's like childhood's in um, I have a cigarette this nicotine filter thing trying to quit smoking um, yeah so what is it Are my ears pointy really I don't get it I think it's like childhood's in you know you ever read that book um, Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> Programming and listening. I did phase out sometimes in the two hours, but I rewound it. You know, I got up and did other things, and I go, oh, I missed it, and I rewound generally too far, so probably spent three hours watching it. Um, oh wait, yeah, I have some notes. I'm not going to play your video back or anything like that, but I have some notes, though, that remind me what I wanted to talk about. Here we go. Spooky freeform movie. It's my... Uh, I don't even want to explain why I had to do this. Okay. I need to work on that. Um, okay. I was working on some other things. It stopped and I got my notes. Awesome. That tiny. Alright. Yeah, we already covered the painting that looks like Piero. 
So it sounds like you paint it and then you realize oh, that's my favorite kind thing like that. Some map of ideas. So where this the bug in drag was at Heroin Church because that's a pretty big compliment put him in there. Was that Heroin Church derived energy? Jay Sander. No. Um half an hour in you ask for feedback. So I'm giving you feedback. I watched the whole thing, I already said that. I had a stopping point, 45 minutes. I used my tool. Actually, I invented a new button because of this. Um, so you don't have to do a 10 second note. It's just a point, because I realized one thing I use this for is I don't really want to play back people's stuff usually. I just want to be able to play back for myself and understand it or have notes, have a thing where I can take notes while I'm watching it, because sometimes I have what, you know, I take notes to the side. Try to make this an easy way, but also just if I stop a video. Also, you broke my video with having things in the hour mark. There's not enough room, so it overwrites. Crazy. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, conferences was interesting. You were talking about energy. I want the site kind of thing to generate. One reason I wanted to have some contest. I want to have contests where different groups vote for their own winner. So there could be more than one winner, and if the group is that has enough resources, then they could PayPal twenty bucks a time or whatever to get together, you know, a thousand dollars for a week at a conference in Hawaii. Of course, I can get really good deals, or you know, really nice places on lagoons, rent three or four houses or big houses, have like a conference. The energy conference is specifically cool too. I've always liked the idea of doing conferences. There's a really great conference center with a lot of Julia Morgan architecture in California. It's owned by the state, I think. It is, and it is a state park, and it's really incredible. With Julia Morgan architecture, and uh, it's a very reasonable place to have conferences. And um, I have designed a business one time where people could work from their own home office, but you would every three or six months you go and get together and you have a meeting, and it's a great thing. And you fund it. I figured out you save so much money on office building, you could fly everybody and a guest, you know, from around the country or at least the country, but even to a certain degree the world, um, for cheaper than renting a great cubicle that they hate, and you can spend money. You know, give them money to fix up their office. And Asilomar is one of the ways I would do it. There's so many nice places to have conferences that are reasonable. Asilomar is especially, it's, it's in Monterey. And, uh, you know, right from the, the cabins, there's a boardwalk that goes across the sand dunes to the ocean. It's just fantastic. Hawaii is a good place for green energy, by the way. Well, the Maui people kind of really were a big part of the biodiesel catching on. Which is a good moment in the psychology of humans, whatever would eventually yield. You know, at that time, it was, you know, using the waste oil. I remember the Chinese restaurant, the waste oil overflowed back then right before I started seeing biodiesel and then there were some people around that were doing their own biodiesel and they said it was really easy and I never really found out even until recently just how straightforward it could be but um yeah this gross sludge spilling out of it was the stinkiest thing ever and they could have been selling it to people <laughs> So it's a good thing, even though there's only so much of it, you don't want to grow. I don't think you want to grow plants to turn them into gasoline you burn. It's not efficient. I'm, uh, we're about the same age. And uh, first I wanted to say, you know, there's only so many times to correct your course 
but just because you die. But then you follow it up with, there's only so many times you can start long-term plans, but come on. By now, how many long-term plans have you had? You're only 40. So it turns out, you know, five years, you know, starts to be a long time even for us. In terms of how much you can get done on a plan, you know. But if you mean a life plan, I mean, certainly there's a, a feeling of middle age, like from Harold and Maude, where, you know, self-determination at 80. But I, I'm into going, making it to 120 myself, so. Um, but we let's still call this middle life, because in terms of long-term plans, I'm not planning. I mean, if you did live from 80 to 120, hopefully you'd have it set up and it would just be comfortable and you'd do, you'd just expand the things that you like to do and you'd be like a 70-year-old healthy person, person. Realistically, you want to go when you lose your health. Um, so that's uh, interesting. You know, <coughs> I talked about unwise flippancy. I'd say when I was young, uh, my unwise flippancy uh, was one, not dismantling a bad relationship. So the opposite of what you described. Being flippant about whatever, and I can take that and I'll fix it and I can do it, and that's okay, I can handle And, um, you know, believe, believe in their own kind of commitment, but still, I did learn from it. I, you know, I made it productive and, uh, in a lot of ways. So, another time was. I got pissed at a job where I had a lot of stock options to vest and I left. And I struggle economically uh, relative to that. And then divorcing and stuff and really have I definitely never recovered to that level, but I you know, I decided to um I know to not do the, the same kind of thing and the dot com was over, so it's a lot harder to get into and a lot less likely to succeed. But um but I left that and uh but I am happy I did that. That definitely worked out. I don't think it would have worked out to, to hang out. Because of the dot crash, a lot of it would have gone away even if I kept it. But there would have been plenty left over. So Probably would have been smarter. Like if I had faced with it now, I'd go, Oh, that's not long term. I'm just talking about doing something for two and a half years for this reward. And then I'll skip out. But at the time, uh, early 30s, I still felt like, That's a long time. I don't want to work for these guys three more years. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and yet it was crazy too because I had them, I was a lead programmer working at home because I got pissed I'm like well I'm just going to work at home they're like you can be a lead programmer work at home be the VP you can be all the stuff and I was like nope man you already pissed me off and that was kind of stupid but that's the stupid I'm glad to be on the other hand the stupid of sticking with the, uh, the bad relationship I could only pretty much justify after my both my girls were born I, I should have been split and I waited uh, four years till after that moment well I whatever actually it was longer before I finally got divorced but um, yeah the painting uh, so very interesting it's not finished so like I said, that was my mom's problem. Like, I don't think she signed this painting. She didn't like to sign it. That would mean it's finished. And she didn't want to admit it was finished. No, got more to do. And she always put a big flaw on it, I think, on purpose to make it. Like, look at this one. See? Oh, this is over here. Okay. People always have some sort of... And she hated techniques. Or, like, my grandpa was an artist, too. But he was kind of... He did a lot of... He became well known and mother load area and painting barns and things and some of his paintings sold for a lot and I, you know but like to make grass he had a particular brush and a technique and my mom didn't like that kind of thing she went to art school but she liked the impressionism and you know you kind of have to make up your own rules to a certain degree something like that painting she's like oh no i just did that with the palette oh no i just wait but that's the stuff of hers that i like um but not that one because what the hell i'm not I'm, Okay, I'm a Vulcan. 
Okay, I'll just take it that way. Welcome. Um, now, the influence of Nietzsche, I think Nietzsche was, I, I was overly into Nietzsche as well, but not really. Because Nietzsche is one of those things, one of the few things, I can think of a couple of Nietzsche's one, that um, lead to their own uh, oh, end. You know, Nietzsche, you read about Nietzsche. I mean, you read his actual words, and yeah, I take that back. You never read about Nietzsche. I've kept away from reading about Nietzsche, because every time I start to read about Nietzsche, I'm up. But I sense in you somebody that got a gist of the same Nietzsche, which means a different Nietzsche, of course. But, I mean, he tells you about overcoming him and that, like, one, you think he's teaching you things, and he says, no, they were already on the tip of your mind. Just, I said a metaphor that, boom, made him real. And, uh, he says that I'm on the steps, I write I write a book, and those are the steps of my progress. So by the time people are like praising me for where I was, or thinking that's great, or thinking where that's where I am, I'm already up there. It's kind of annoying. But I don't think he was really annoyed by it. I think just that was one of his subtle ways of going, well look, when I die, I'm, I'm on that step, and you're supposed to keep going. And he's one of the few that's anti-worship, so it really bothers me there's this guy the Taoist, who's real skeptic, uh, I mean, he's real uh, mystical, you know, Mayan prophecy, numerology, and, and he's got the Zarathustra and Nietzsche thing mixed up with his metaphysics that I find really offensive, even though the guy's you know, sweet enough. But I find it really offensive, this statement of Nietzsche, but because Nietzsche is where I get my whole material spirituality idea, truth be told. And, um, you know, when Nietzsche says things about what the advantage of being misunderstood is, um, or rather hard to understand, um, I think the misunderstanding is sort of willful by people, and that really what's there is something hard to understand. And yet there's this message that comes through clear. I'm constantly astounded how to certain mentalities, it seems like, like the devil is, like the, the Antichrist, I mean, it's obviously, you know, it's real title, Antichristian, and it's obviously not, I don't know, it's more like, of course, to, to a certain dogma, certain open-mindedness, seems cataclysmic. But if I recall, and then Nietzsche ends up praising Christianity as a necessary organic part of history. You know, and, and, and like him, leading to its over, own overcoming. So maybe the point is everything leads to its own overcoming, and Nietzsche, I think, helps make that conscious, but some people know, like the Catalus is totally has them in this mythology of his. I don't think the Nazis count because they were just like, it's Germany, he's also a Nazi, yes, everybody. Um, you know, they knew better. He, he was pretty over it about, uh, as I quoted recently. But, um, you know, I've, I did struggle with it though because, um, like, I, one time I found myself trying to explain his views on women, or even on Napoleon and war. And in the end, I mean, it was once I successfully did, I hunted out the phrases where he's saying, these are just my truths. And, you know, basically there's some apologia for his views on women that are about, this is just me. And, and you know, he was raised by a couple Lutheran women and stuff, and, you know, he admits that, but then I had to also admit sort of subtly, and he goes on to say what he says, and I, I almost think, in a way, it was like, well, the ultimate justification for him is that he put thing, some unjustifiable things in there, because also about being in the age of war, it was more about overcoming, it's like, look, don't idolize me, 
I'm just leading to you. If there's anything good about me and you're a free thinker in the future and you owe me a step, then great. I wrote a great book and you can laugh at how I say so out loud. But really, you have to see me as a sexist old codger or whatever. And um, you know, some of the sympathy for people like, you know, I've always liked the Diogenes and the you know, a homeless philosopher, or radical, or wild-haired, or any, you know, ho train riding, jumping, you know, Jack Kerouac, um, kinds of the poets, you know. Um, and I think uh, Nietzsche integrates a lot of this, gives me sympathy for some of the more hysterical types even, even though Nietzsche wasn't hysterical at all, but somehow it integrates, um, You know, what I hope would be the healthy form of sardonic and sarcastic versus the um, ignorant form, you know. Um, I think it's interesting you said overcoming him because the way I did was, you know, just to see, well, okay, there's these things in there and he must have meant it when he said you won't be able to really uh, understand me well enough to characterize me well enough to form a cult over me. and people try anyway and so um, you know what bugs me about when people do that is it's like there's a Nazi occultism which Nietzsche was against any of that kind of thing any occultism or metaphysicalisms and that just kind of way of thinking and um, and yet when someone like the, the Gataoist talks about Nietzsche that way I feel like it's an excuse to take on Nazi occultism. I, I believe guilt by association and ad hominem against anybody with a sympathy to the to the not to the Nazi occultism. It's a terribly ridiculous pattern of occultism with the, the worst of fantasy hoping and bad motivation creating. Though I don't cr think it created Nazism, don't get me wrong, I don't think it leads to genocide. I think a bunch of genocidal maniacs were naturally sort of drawn to it um, because it's, it's it's like, it's the self-fulfilling, it b puts the Bible to shame in terms of being any sort of interpretation you care to take is available. I mean, people stretch to get some of these things out of the Bible they've gotten, but it's like you don't even have to with Nazi occultism, it's just sort of built in shitty view of the universe, in my view. And I think that attitude comes from Nietzsche. I was obsessed with Wagner, and I took Wagner on as an example of uh, what people that, you know, group mind, group thinker people. See, I'm playing with all that now with groups. I feel like I'm strong enough now to uh, face the group questions and issues with uh, you know uh, more awareness of what, how it really works and, and what is you know, what's the good and bad and which really goes together and is separable and stuff um, uh, I, I still think it's a pretty interesting metaphor between the free thinker and, and not the free thinker. Um, but, you know, I eventually got away from any notion of, um, of that it was metaphysically true. I mean, I think while I was reading Nietzsche getting into him, I was, I think the main theme and the reason I, I thank it is it is a kind of thinking that leads away from metaphysical thinking. Like, this idea that um, that uh, uh, even if you're in a dream world, it still matters, and so it's material and, and so on. So the poets, and I associate you know Nietzsche with metaphor and the revenge of the poets and cognitive science, where metaphor is so dominant that the world really is metaphorical for us. It really is. And it can't be any other way. You just get to decide which metaphors, and that's enough freedom. 
um, you don't need direct access to reality to get it all with metaphors, and it's just it's actually quite lovely. Um, and um, and then I discovered um, pyrrhonistic skepticism, and I found that Nietzsche's mention of skepticism is fascinating. Uh, it's as if he chose not to speak of it except for a couple times. And in a way I think that's very revealing, like a socket plugged into um, an outlet. It only needs one plug that's really hooked to a whole network and it's hooked to the other plugs in the house and so on. It can make a connection very simply. And I think that Nietzsche most certainly is not a skeptic but that his philosophy is one that can be put on a skeptical foundation. The skeptical foundation is the kind of thing we can build all kinds of very different philosophies, even one like Nietzsche or anything else really, that maintains some sort of um, integrity, compatibility of, of uh, what, how we define the word honest for the most part. And uh, Yeah. So, um, yeah. I like those ideas, and I would be into a stick'em room. I would like to maybe make it so that there's an easy way to go to stick'em or embed a stick'em kind of thing at the website, too. Um, I looked into the stick'em API. They release a stick'em thing now. They say it's like, for a stick'em quality video, it's going to be five cents a minute per viewer. So if you have just one camera, but a hundred people, that's five dollars. I'm sorry, not a minute per hour, five cents per hour. That'd be five dollars an hour, though, right? For a hundred people and just one video thing. So it adds up kind of quick. I don't think anybody wants to pay for that. On the other hand, if I set up a dedicated, I'm talking to some people here locally that need a video server co-op ID and if I set up this video server for them in person I have access to the machine I can set up a, I can set up a stick and kind of server there's a couple open source things and if it's crappy well I'll just wait as it gets better or something I mean if it doesn't work perfect we'll see there's always ways to clutch things off and if you, if you have access to the machine so that'd be cool because I'd like to have that kind of thing and again play with these group ideas. I mean I want to have a group and openness mixed with groups where I'm, you know like Karen could have a, a conversation among people in the book culture group that she's maintaining or, or stick them among them and maybe only they could go on cam and everybody else can watch or maybe they're just the moderators and anybody can, you know each group and idea can have its own rules. And that's the point. Instead of saying no rules about groups and everybody's equal and we'll pretend there's not a group and then there's groups that form in the secondary space, when we be overt about everything and people are in multiple groups and depending on the context, you know, and you might be in a group where there's no cussing and if you can't handle that you won't be in that group, but if you can't, it doesn't mean you don't cuss in your own videos and in other groups maybe you're required to cuss. Same person could be in both groups if they're willing to adjust to local uh, local rules and plenty of people will just keep it open. And I think we have to have a mixture. And we have to, um, you know, risk and experiment with these ideas, knowing how dangerous they are. Yes, of course, of course. I wouldn't say otherwise. So, was it like how different from me smoking? Is me chewing on a tampon? I mean, using my filter machine. No, it looks like a tampon inserter. I hear. Actually, I forget what they look like, but it, it seems like I found a couple around before that something to do. I don't know, not the tampon itself, but the uh, thing. So, um, I wonder how long I can make this video. No, I'm just kidding. That was hysterical. So, 15 minutes. Uh, I'm already nine minutes into my 15 minute half hour. <laughs> that was like, um, that was like uh, it was like somebody that expected to die at 20 uh, living to 160 
<laughs> that was great. Um, I think you're great. Um, you're my favorite video YouTuber, along with... Um, uh, Hannibal Barca at the moment, but you know, I mean, Kratex may be one of the all time uh, favorites, and I have to admit, you you know, people like in Mandam, even though I said, look, no, of course not, but you know, I've watched a lot of those videos. You gotta, there's a lot of ways to calculate favor when you get into it. But seriously, there's not many people who what I would be like at the beginning of a two hour video thinking, Holy shit, I've got to watch a two-hour video. <laughs> Sometimes people do that to me, like, I'll make a long video, like, even this one, like, why'd you make me watch it? I'm like, I didn't make you watch it. But still, on their side, maybe, they, you know, it's kind of a subtle compliment or an uh, over-compliment, because they're like, they thought they had to watch it. <laughs> why? But I know why I'm like, because I watched that <laughs> Don parody, and at the time, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? And when's he going to start talking? And, it, and then it's like, no, he's going to actually sing the whole thing. It's a whole... I couldn't believe it. It was a perfect mix of organized and improv that I just, uh, I love that. It's actually, I like unfinished paintings if they're unfinished on purpose. But um, uh, yeah, at that point, it's like if you do a three hour video, I've got to watch it, but it's not your problem. I'll find time where maybe I'll forget, you know, you don't not make them just out of kindness. But I'm glad it was an hour long tonight, because it's one already, I gotta go to sleep, I can go into something in the morning. Uh, so, um, that's my feedback, and I haven't watched Grey Tex's answer yet, so I want it to be unadulterated. Alright, cheers. Okay, so, more true plan time. Okay, so look, in a way, the the group slash clustering stuff I'm doing is just a statistical feature of keeping track of channels and groups for all kinds of reasons, right? Um, and I saw that I could use it to have my own subscriptions thing, so I used it a little bit for that, uh, though not entirely. And um, but also, this this was an opportunity because see, I kind of wanted to create a group of philosophers of a certain school that doesn't want to be defined and all disagrees with everybody else in the school. You know, I, I've always, in college, I tried to create this group. I kind of did, but it didn't really go anywhere because people just didn't quite get it, but called a disassociation, you know, of people that agree to disagree in a certain way. And of course, it's like in philosophy where there's all this disagreement, but they agree on certain tenets of logic. And even when they disagree on the tenets of logic, they agree on methods of disagreeing about it, right? And when they disagree about those methods, at least they agree about being overt and s trying to state what the disagreement is, you know what I mean? It's like this way always to clarify disagreement until at least you feel like you know what it is. Um, <laughs> if not in every case, you know. So, uh, but anyway, to make a, like, that's what the semi-urge thing was, and this part-time work philosophy and creating in some pro-life, pro-living, but not obviously pro-life is taken, I won't, you know, and so, and there's, somebody used the word demiurge, and I looked that up, what's that again, it's a cool word, but then it has religious, and it's godlike, and then I kind of like the semi-urge, but I would go for any name, because the real thing was this cohesion, and there's people I left out of that group, I might have added uh, plenty of people um, that I, I, I just wanted to add a core group. I kind of wanted to choose people that might be a little bit offended by being put in a group uh, because that's a part of that group. It was like, what? And then I would tell them, well, you can't stop me from saying, look, there's a group. I think it's a group. You can say I'm apophenia or whatever. So kind of, uh, but really also to make that group and maybe some of the people that weren't named, we'd get in there, we'd say, well, what do you think? And some people I just kind of wondered on the borderline, like putting conference support in there, or would he be bothered in a way that I couldn't explain with a, like, well, haha, I categorized you because it's wrong to do. Um, but also, I'm not sure if he's, I did want, see, I wanted to make this group under the cover of, I didn't want to just, okay, my first group, here's five people, I'm in there, and there's, 
And that would have made sense because it's five people I want to go and look at recent activity. I like being able to see all their videos in that grid, so. But by doing the F list, it was like, okay, well, here's 30 people. They're all against it, these five. And then, and I end up testing a lot with the F list because, you know, a big group like that is, is handy, you know shows up problems and if it's gonna be slow and made me realize okay I've got to optimize and stuff but you know I would wonder if to be serious would want to be in a semi urge uh, be in this semi urge or they or some other groups I want to make other positive associations that we can be lighthearted about but also take seriously like okay this group is going to discuss something and and if it's open then consciously so and the people in the group are moderators and, and do voting in terms of what counts as a reply you know did that person really reply to the topic you know is it acceptable to the rules we posted when we started the discussion or there is no rules um, the uh, and I see Semerge as, as an idea as sort of maybe a slightly more philosophically serious version of the philosophically respectable uh, you know uh, subgenius kind of concepts you know that you don't have to overachieve to be awesome um, and that actually that's that's a facility towards you know focused overachievement and creating a great work that's like if I did this all the time, I would be exhausted, you know. So, um, anyway, yeah. So I want to create some sort of a, a loose affiliation that I could stomach. And I'm very, very sensitive to any group and group politic and, oh, well, I don't like that person in the group anymore, so you're supposed to ostracize them. I mean, my instinct is if, like, if I'm in a group, or like in family, if I have a disagreement with somebody in the family, I don't want the rest of the family to ostracize them. If the rest of the family ostracizes them because of my beef with them, I feel guilty. I'd rather just be able to be angry and know that you know nobody else holds against them, usually. And uh, sometimes it can be offensive in that regime where it's like, but wait a second, you're gonna, what? Because that does mean, why could you trust? But you know, still I'd rather feel that way. And so, you know, I, <laughs> I think I'm strong enough to, um, to see how this goes to use these um, these ideas as flashlights and laser beams and and just um, not use them for isolation and demonization and somehow make the, that's why I'm making all the edges blurry so that when you try some people will want to use the blurry edges and be able to be in both sides you know evolutionist and Christian people going, no, you can't be in both those groups, and they're like, well, I am, so fuck you, you know, and they have the videos to prove it, you know, that's why I, I we promote that at the edges, to just confuse the negative sides of grouping, because there's something beautiful to pattern, or making all that paint be me, and me represent whatever philosophical idea is going on with that, and putting all this paint into be this woman on a bike and really it's it's just paint on top of paint you know so uh yeah um that's grouping that's that's making a free substance into into a form and it's really just a bunch of molecules next to other molecules right but it's also gets to be a group and a pattern and a form and um, we can like heal our unhealthy group behavior. I, I think it's just because of you know slave hangover, of being slaves and being masters. That um, I think there are free people now, and that they suffer still a hangover, but uh, that their head will become more uh, free, and that it's going to be done with art, and that it's going to be an artist's revolution and a poet's revolution. And that that's going to be the fruition of the meek um, inheriting their earth. Um, and, you know, that should be fun because it's, the meek can be sarcastic and kind of caustic. It's just that they don't really like to torture people and stuff. So it's not like it's going to be boring and 
the meek aren't like um, leave it to beaver uh, they're not even really that meek um, but uh, yeah they don't want to waste money on war or emotion on it and I, and I think um, that a free mind leads to, to a kind of strength that I'm willing to think of as meek strength you know and uh, that comes through through kinds of realization of just how good life can be um, and even people that really are in tune with other ways of feeling powerful uh, benefit when they get a glimpse of this and, and then the people left over uh, there might even be room for them in a world where they can't do all out war you know? so cage fighting somebody that wants to cage fight might, not, might be good to have around <laughs> but um, you know and if they want to rage on the public then um, you know then we have a combat and you might still have that too and that, that might be a something that keeps humans alive and remembering, you know, not to let things go too far downhill. But I really believe a lot of that can be solved and you have the boxers and the sports kind of, of rage and stuff, cathartic, but, you know, that we can really um, get to something better. And I think it's when everybody's an artist and not an artist that sells their art or shares their art with, with everybody, but, you know, artists that their whole life are like kids that, you know, it's like, look, I drew a picture. It wasn't that good, but that's what I was thinking. Oh, really? You were thinking that? Interesting. You know, it looks like a frog, not a pig, but now that I know that's a pig, I see what you were thinking. I remember that pig, and it does look like Fester the pig. 